All right, we're going. Welcome to our virtual program and lesson with the Tenant Museum. I'm Julia, an educator at the museum, and I'm really happy to be here with you this afternoon. In this program, we're going to see the inside of an 1868 tenement apartment with a very, very special tour guide. An actress is going to play a young woman named Bridget Moore, who emigrated from Ireland to New York in the year 1863. Rizit has just moved into a new home. She'll show us her home and the many things she has inside. She'll also tell us about how she finds comfort in her home and perhaps inspire us to see how comfort can be found in our everyday objects too. If you're tuning in live, you can comment and ask us questions in the YouTube chat box throughout the event. Now, let me introduce you to the Tenement Museum. The Tenement Museum tells the stories of immigrants, migrants, and refugees in the United States. That means we talk about people who were born outside of the United States and moved there to live. This building is 97 Orchard Street. Many immigrants and their kids lived in this building in the past. Today, no one lives here anymore. Now it's a museum, the Tenement Museum. A tenement is an old fashioned word for apartment building. In this tenement, there are 22 apartments, meaning 22 families lived here at one time, each with their own apartment. There are five floors and four apartments on every floor. The building is in New York City in a neighborhood called the Lower East Side. All the families that we talk about at the Tenement Museum, like Bridget Moore and her family, were real people. They were not famous or rich, just regular people. And they had no idea that their homes and their stories would be shared with people from all over the world. Just think about that for a second. Actually look around where you are right now. Could you imagine people in the future checking out your home to learn about you and your daily life? That they might be impressed with how brave you are being during this pandemic. We think that the stories and histories of ordinary people are just as important as the ones of rich and famous people. So now let's zoom back to the past, to 1868. This is the living room or parlor of Bridget Moore's family apartment in a tenement building on Orchard Street. The sun is coming in through two big windows and it is bright inside. Why don't you take a few moments to look closely at this photograph? Look at the different objects in the living room. Do they bring up any questions for you? I see about six wooden chairs around the room and a wide open space where a brown carpet with red and green stripes lays. There might even be enough room for dancing. <laughs> Besides the sunlight coming in, we can see some lanterns. One is between the windows. Another one is on the fireplace, sitting on some patterned dark green fabric. With no electricity, it must have been pretty dark inside once the sun goes down. On the walls, um, I see a mirror. I see a drawing of a person between the windows and something else hung up by itself on the wall across from the mirror. Perhaps Bridget will tell us more about these things when we meet her. Before Bridget shows us her home, though, well, let's learn a little bit more about her history. These are pictures of the country where Bridget is from, Ireland, from the time before she came to the United States. Bridget may have grown up in a stone house with a thatched roof like this one 
in the picture on the left. And her family may have been farmers working on a hilly field like the picture on the right. You might have noticed that the soil in the field looks dry and we don't see any plants. Many people left Ireland and moved to the United States because there wasn't enough food. People were starving. It was a famine. Bridget's parents knew that she could not have a good future in Ireland. Perhaps they also needed her to send them money from the United States to help the family. In New York City, there were lots of other Irish immigrants and more chances to earn money. When Bridget immigrated to the United States from Ireland, she was only 17 years old. She came by herself on a ship that traveled six weeks to get to New York. This is an illustration from 1871. People of all ages are boarding a ship that's gonna take them to a new country. Next to the mast, there's a man carrying a heavy load. And underneath the ropes, I see a group of children gathering around someone with a top hat, holding up a doll. Maybe he's selling them. It makes me think about the things people might bring or might leave behind when they move. Maybe for a child, having a doll to hold on to could provide some comfort on this journey. When Bridget gets to the United States, She'll need to find a home. Bridget lives in a few different homes. And one place that Bridget lives is a neighborhood called Five Points. Five Points was a neighborhood of new immigrants from Ireland, some immigrants from China, and many Black Americans. In this image, we can see lots of activity with people cleaning, playing in the yard, looking out over their balconies, and someone is fixing the chimney. After Bridget got married to her husband, Joseph, their first home together was in the Five Points. They have three children, Mary Catherine, Jane, and Agnes. The good thing about the Five Points was that the cost of renting an apartment was low. And there were many other Irish people for Bridget and Joseph to talk to. However, the bad thing was that the living conditions were not sanitary and there was a high chance of getting sick. Bridget and Joseph decide to move to the tenement at 97 Orchard Street. At that time, 97 Orchard Street was a neighborhood called Klein Deutschland, which means Little Germany. The apartment and living conditions in Klein Deutschland were better than in the Five Points. However, most of the people in their building and in the neighborhood were immigrants from Germany. So Bridget and her family might have felt like outsiders. In fact, at this time in history, many people in the United States were suspicious of Irish immigrants and had unfair opinions about them. There were stereotypes that said Irish people were poor, dirty, and had diseases and liked to fight. Many Irish people who wanted jobs were discriminated against. Having to deal with those prejudices and poor treatment would make life difficult for the Moors. But let's see for ourselves. Now that we've learned more about Bridget and her journey, let's get ready to meet her. Before we enter Bridget's apartment, you can prepare to take a few notes. So take a second and get something to write with. While you watch, I'd like you to write down any item or object that tells us about Bridget's connection to her culture or home, okay? All right, let's meet Bridget. Oh, good day. My name is Mrs. Bridget Mihan Moore. It's a pleasure to meet you. 
welcome to me home. Come inside, come inside. I live here with my husband, Joseph, and I got three little girls, three wee ones. Mary Kate, she's three, and Jane, she's two years old. And then little Agnes, just a wee bab still in my arms. And well, we're new in this building. What do you think of me new home? I must say I'm quite proud of it. And we got three rooms all to ourselves. The landlord, Mr. Glockner, he tells me he built this building in 1863, which means it's only five years old. It'd be in 1868. And we got a kitchen and a bedroom and a proper parlor for receiving guests. It's different from any place I've ever lived, especially where I grew up. Oh, where's that? Oh, I come from Ireland. It's an island far across the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, well, look, we got a map on the wall. Would you like to see? Oh, I bought the map a few years ago at a church fair, and we put it on the wall to, well, to remember, but also to teach our girls about Ireland. Aye, that's where I grew up. I grew up on a farm. We had a one-room stone home with a thatched roof and a dirt floor and oh, I grew up with me ma and me da and me brothers and me sisters and then I left them behind and came to New York City. I think me girls will never meet their grandparents. We do try to teach them about Ireland, try to teach them about their traditions. Uh, music, for example. I, my husband Joseph, plays the fiddle. Well, for work, he's a waiter in a restaurant in the old neighborhood, but sometimes at night, if he's not too tired, he'll come home and he'll play music for the girls. And Oh, well, here's his fiddle bow. And, well, me Joseph, he wouldn't believe what sweet sounds he coaxes out of it. On the table over there, we keep a book called Murr's Irish Melodies. It was written by Thomas Murr, but no relation of Joseph's. At least we don't think so, but my favorite is a song called The Last Rose of Summer. And well, I think that's me girl's favorite too. Sometimes Joseph will play fiddle to it. And well, the youngest Agnes, she's too young to understand, of course, but when Joseph and me dance, well, her eyes get big and she laughs. So I like to think she understands. Well, it reminds me a bit of where I left Ireland. Well, the potatoes, they rotted away in the ground and that's what we grew on our farm, you see, and Even when the potatoes were coming back, there weren't no work and there weren't no one to marry, so... When I was 17, my ma and my dad, they said, Brady, you must go to America. And to America I went. Well, Mary Kate and Jane have left some of their ties out. These are me girls' dallies, made from scraps of old fabric. You know, I've noticed we don't speak the same language as most of our neighbors in the building, they're German, but me girls make friends wherever they go, playing down in the backyard. That's where I go every day for the water. Would you like to see in the kitchen? So this here is me coal burning stove. Hey, cooking here is quite different than it was in Ireland. There we cooked over a heart using peat uh, with some called tar. And here, well, we're cooking with coal. It goes on the top of the stove. And well, this is one of the many things that I got to go all the way down the stairs many times a day to collect. I'm going down to the cellar for the coal. I'm going down to the backyard for the water. And that's where I meet my neighbours. Got to admit to you, I don't understand a word they say. 
All of me neighbours are German, except for Mrs. Mary Kennedy and her husband, who's also Irish, like me. Well, I told you, me girls, they have no trouble playing with the other children in the building, but, well, I do wish I could talk to me neighbours, make some more friends in this building. Over here is me St. Bridget's Cross. Would you like to see? Ah, well, me family is Catholic, you see. And so we hang the St. Bridget's Cross above the door and we believe that it protects the home from bad things like hunger and like fire. And well, when we first moved to this building, I think some of me neighbours thought that this was a little strange or suspicious to have this above the door. Well, most of them aren't Catholic and well, some of them are, but they're German and they have their own saints, I suppose. But now that we know our neighbours a little better, well, they don't look at it so strange anymore. I suppose they've gotten used to it. And it's a good thing they have, because we would never think of taking it down. Well, our religion is very important to us, you see. Every Sunday, we go to church at St. Pat's, and every night we pray the rosary. Oh, would you like to take a quick peek in our bedroom before you go? Well, I think me rosary is the most precious thing I own. Me ma gave it to me, you see right before I got on the boat to come to America. And, well, me ma, she weren't one for crying. And she gave me the rosary, her eyes were shining. And she said to me, Bridie, you take it and you take it to America and then I will always be with you. And so every night when I say my prayers, I remember my mom and I pray for her. And each bead is a prayer, you know. And so I always say one for my ma before I go to sleep. say goodbye to you. It's been so lovely chatting. I do get lonely in this building. You know, life in America hasn't always been what I expected. It can be quite hard, but well, it has its moments of joy too and I got a family of my own now. Well, perhaps you'll come again. It was lovely to meet you. But for now, goodbye. It was lovely to meet ya. Well, it was lovely to meet you too, Bridget. Thank you so much for sharing your home and story with us. To everyone watching this video, I wonder what some of the objects that you noted were. Why don't you type them in the comment box? Meanwhile, I'll talk about, talk about something that I noticed. Bridget told us about her St. Bridget's Cross that protects her home. A lot of people have objects or symbols that they use for protection especially in new or dangerous situations. I thought it was interesting that Bridget said that the neighbors thought it was strange or suspicious that she hung it up, but she did it anyway. I think that shows a lot of bravery. Let's see if there's anything else that you noticed. The clock on the mantle. Oh, that's a really good example. I don't know about you, but I feel like time moves differently right now during this pandemic. And Bridget being in a situation where she was sort of new and um, trying to figure things out, I wonder what time felt like for her, if it went slow or if it went fast. And somebody also noted the rosary, right? 
seems like the rosary was important to her because um, of her faith. She said she was Catholic, so it connected to her to her her spirituality, but also because it was from her mom. So whenever she held it, she could think of her mother. And that's really nice, but also it's a little bit sad, right? So we can think about how these objects of comfort help, but they don't make everything better in a way. They help. The music book is a great example um, where they could find songs that they could sing and dance to and from a book create moments to share together as a family. Mm -hmm. Oh, and somebody also shared a connection between a mezuzah and a St. Bridget's cross. A mezuzah is an um, encased prayer scroll that many Jewish families might put on their doorways. It's very similar. That's a great example. Ah, yes, and uh, the map of Ireland. So we noticed that in the picture that there was something on that wall, and Bridget told us that, um, that what was on her wall was a map of Ireland, right? And we can imagine that she might have looked at that map of Ireland and, and showed her children that map. And I bet that her and her children would have seen different things when they looked at that map. Bridget probably would have seen her family and the rolling green hills and to her kids, it was, it was a map, right? But you gotta start somewhere. And somebody asked if, if we think that Bridget got homesick. What did you, why don't you, what do you all think about that? To me, it seems like she did, especially when she was saying how she missed her mom. And she also mentioned how her kids won't get to know their grandparents. So it seems like some things in the United States had joy, um, but there was a lot of hardship for her too. Was there anything else that anyone noticed in terms of objects? If not, um, oh, I will talk about one more that I see here, the blue and white china. Right, maybe you saw in her kitchen that there were some plates um, there that were blue and white. Really nice item, right? Maybe something like that was something that she um, brought with her or maybe they were given to her as a gift and maybe on special occasions, they might've used those things together as a family. So now I'm going to take us to the present, all right? Um, and I wanna think about the objects that help us find comfort today, right? Um, Bridget was an immigrant and maybe some of you have that experience. I personally don't, um, but I think that all of us are going through something right now where we need some comfort right now, right? Um, and I wanna share some objects that people have actually shared with the Tenement Museum that give them comfort. And I'm going to share two of those stories with you. Maurice tells us the story of his teddy bear. His mother gave it to him when he was four, and it always reminded him of her. One day, he realized the teddy bear was lost. He looked all over for it, but he couldn't find it. At first, Maurice couldn't sleep. The bear reminded him of his mother, especially when she worked long days away from home. Slowly, though, he was able to move on without the bear. One day though, he found it in his mother's dresser. This taught him that even though, even though the things we love aren't necessary, it does not necessarily make them less meaningful. I'll share another story with you. Teresa's grandmother, Ma, migrated from Puerto Rico when she was 19 for a nursing degree. She brought the recipe for empanadas and made them during holidays. Ma taught Teresa and her cousins to make the empanadas. Also, when she can, Teresa and her father go to the local bodega every Thursday to buy some. Teresa says she doesn't always feel Latina, but empanadas help her connect to that part of her identity. 
The empanadas bring everyone together, reminding her that the dish is a representation of hard work, family, and culture and shows her how grateful she is for her family, especially during hard times. So like you all, I'm spending more time at home than I ever expected. And I found some objects here that have been giving me comfort as we get through this pandemic. Are there any everyday objects that are providing you comfort? Maybe you didn't think about it till now, but take a moment and look around you. And how do the things you see make you feel? What makes you feel happy or what makes you feel something? In the comment box, you can write the name of an object and a sentence about it. But while you look around and think about that, let me first share an example, okay? Let me just get it. All right. So these red pots here, these belong to my grandma, Nanny. She passed away last year. When my mom was cleaning her house, she gave them to me. To be honest, I just needed pots, so I didn't think too much about it. But now that I'm inside cooking every day, when I use these pots, I wonder about what Nanny thought as she cooked with the same pots. She was an immigrant from England in the 1940s, and she was raising a family in a small town in Pennsylvania without her mother, father, or brothers and sisters around. I bet she wondered a lot about how her life would turn out. And she ended up creating a close loving family. I'm not really sure how things are going to turn out either, but cooking with these pots reminds me to be hopeful and also helps me to appreciate the people that I have to, to support and to be supported by. So, I'm wondering if any of you thought of any objects. Let's see. So D um, also connects to grandmother and says, I'm going to wear my grandmother's watch while things hang on a chain. My mother's parents came to New York City from Hungary. Yeah, that's a great thing, watch hanging on a chain. That's a really, really great connection, right? And David also has his grandpa's ring. It's really interesting that we connect to the people who came before us. I think Bridget talked about that too, about her parents. Um, and Jim also has, or sorry, excuse me, Jill has grandmother's umbrella hanging in the dining room. Ah, and she would always take it with her. Whenever she sees it, she feels closer to her. Yeah, I relate that too. Vic tells us a breadboard. Um, his mother used to make polenta and now you're using it to make bread. I wonder how many of these items are things that you started to use or appreciate more now that we're home more. I wonder if we can get a few more objects from people. They can really be anything. They don't have, it doesn't have to be someone that something gave you. I could also say that my piano gives me a lot of comfort these days too. And that's just something that eases my mind. Barbara tells her that her two cats are a great source of comfort. <laughs> yes, I definitely agree with that too. And Allison tells us um, that her aluminum pots are a great source of comfort. It's interesting that so many of these things also have to do with um, with um, food and cooking too, right? Food and cooking is a way that we often come together and it, it's when we make memories with the people that we love. So no wonder that our objects of comfort have to do with um, food. 
Oh, and then somebody submitted a story to um, to the Tenement Museum, and I'll share a little bit more about that in a second, about a stuffed cat um, plushie. Fli oh, it's a, sorry, a stuffed cat plushie uh, named Flippy. That's a great example. <laughs> it combines the warmth of a cat with a something to cuddle up with. see is there anything else out there that anyone would like to share these are all really great examples roberta shares her mother's sewing scissors ah that's a great one mm -hmm. i wonder if you're having more time to sew during these days i myself can't sew at all but i could see that um, creating clothes for someone and remembering that can be a great source of comfort. If any other um, ob objects come in, feel free to share them, but I just wanted to say thank you for sharing those. Um, and um, to let you know that we think all of those objects really deserve to be in a museum. They're really special. Um, and in fact, if you would like to put them in a museum or contribute them to the Tenement Museum's collection, uh, there is a way to do that. Just a minute here. We have a website called Your Story, Our Story, um, and actually, a collection there right now called Objects of Comfort. Um, and you can upload your stories to share, or you can read thousands of other object stories from people today. So just go to yourstory.tenement.org. Now, um, if there aren't any other objects to share for now, was just wondering if um, I could take some time to answer any of the questions that came up during the program, either about the Tenement Museum or Bridget or her apartment or anything like that. So one of those questions is, do we know what part of Ireland Bridget was from? You know what, we don't. And that leads to something else about the Tenement Museum because the people that we tell stories about are, are not really famous, they don't have a lot of documentation about them. So we don't always know all the details about people's lives. So we know she was from Ireland from different documents, but we don't have anything that tells us exactly where she is from. Though we often assume it's from somewhat, somewhere more rural as most of the migrants from that time were. And then another person wonders if she could read or write. Actually, we don't know that either. Um, we know Bridget probably spoke English, um, which might have been an advantage for her working in the United States. And we wonder about reading and writing because she probably would have wanted to write letters or be in touch with her family. So even if she or her family wasn't able to read or write, they probably would have found a way um, to transcribe or to have somebody help them so that they could stay in touch with people. And somebody wonders how long Bridget lived in the house. So actually, Bridget just lived in this house in 97 Orchard for one year. Um, and then she moved to another neighborhood that not wasn't so far away, but it was actually closer to the church that they went to, St. Patrick's Cathedral. So another question that has come in is, where did the kids sleep? Well, probably they would have switched places where they slept. Um, if they could fit in the bedroom, they might sleep in the bedroom. Actually, we can see that there's a little um, crib in the bedroom there and perhaps Sometimes the kids might have slept in the parlor or even when it was cold, maybe they even slept where it was warm near the stove in the kitchen. Um, but families would have been creative in their three room apartments. And someone else is wondering where the bathroom is. 
you might have noticed that there is not a bathroom in this apartment. In 1868, there was no running water inside the tenement museum. So, or it wasn't a museum, the tenement home, the tenement building. So if you needed water, you had to go outside to the backyard where there was a pump. And back there, there were also four toilets or privies that they shared with the 22 other families that lived in the building. But I'll tell you that these toilets, they actually flushed which was probably better from the museum, or I'm sorry, from the, the neighborhood, the Five Points where Bridget was living before. Um, so that might've been a helpful situation once they moved here. And then one more question that I see here is, did Bridget work outside the home? If so, what did she do? So. Bridget, during the time of 1868, when we made this video, um, when we based this video, she was not working. She was working very hard to take care of this home. Um, but before she married Joseph, we, we think that she worked as a domestic servant, meaning that she went to somebody of uh, somebody else's home, a, a middle-class person, probably a person born in the United States, and she would help with the cleaning, perhaps the childcare, um, maybe the cooking. Um, and that's what a lot of these young Irish women who were coming to America were doing at that time. They were working as domestic servants. Are there any other questions? How did Bridget meet Joseph? I would love to know how Bridget met Joseph. I really would. Maybe it was at a dance hall. Maybe it was at the street. Maybe it was at church. All I can tell you is they um, got married in 1864, which is pretty soon after they um, came to the United States. So um, I guess it's even possible they knew each other before, um, but you know, they had they had a lot of kids, so I guess it worked out for them. Are there any other questions? Okay, if those are all of the questions, I think we'll um, start wrapping up for the day. And I'll let you know about next week's program. So I had a really great time today and I really hope that you enjoyed learning with us too. For next week, we'll have a program on time capsules. Time capsules are containers of all shapes and sizes that capture a moment. Sometimes time capsules are planned. Other times they're found by chance. People have described 97 Orchard as a time capsule, an abandoned building, rediscovered after 50 years and then opened up to help us learn about the past. So you can join the Tenement Museum as we explore what some of the objects inside tell us about the lives of families who once lived there. We'll also learn about a very ambitious time capsule buried deep underground. Finally, we'll show you some ways to capture your own experiences during this moment. So you can make a family time capsule full of objects, images, and documents to share with future historians. So you can visit our website to see all of our upcoming programs and sign up for our newsletter. So I'll give you a second to jot that down if you'd like. All right, so everyone, it was so nice spending this time with you today. I really loved hearing about your object stories. It provided me much comfort. Um, and I hope that we can see you next week. Bye.